It's hard to believe how long we've been in this weird place of COVIDness, isn't it? I was thinking that we had just begun a film series for Lent. John McGuckin and I put together what we called the Cinema of Grace. We even had planned for what we were going to do in 2021. It didn't happen either. But there was a film that I wanted to show this past year called Babette's Feast. Have any of you seen Babette's Feast? If you get a chance to see it, you've got to read the subtitles because it's not in English. It's at least 25 years old, and it did win the Academy Award for the Best Foreign Language Film the year it came out, and I should have looked up what year it came out. But Babette's Feast is an amazing film. Babette is the lead character. She is a French woman. This is about the turn of the 19th into the 20th century around there, and she is a refugee from France who travels to Denmark to the home of two elderly spinster sisters. She comes with a letter of recommendation saying she'd like to be their housekeeper. And they said, we don't have anything to pay you. And she said, I'll live here. Just let me have room and board, and I'll stay here, and I'll cook, and I'll clean, and I'll take care of you. Now, these sisters are spinsters because their father, who has long since died, was the leader and the founder of a denomination. It has become very small. There are five or six people left in his church because one of the things that they were not allowed to do was marry. They all had to be celibate. Trouble with a group of celibates is they don't tend to have children coming into their midst. Because a lot of people don't want to come into that sort of circumstance. That's why I don't think we have many shakers left in the world, because shakers also live separate lives, men and women in different buildings. And where'd all the little shakers come from? You know, that's the question you've got to ask yourself. Well, the sisters had been young and beautiful at one point, and there is a flashback to the time when the father chases off all their suitors because he wants them to focus their hearts and minds on God. They have focused on God so long they focus on nothing else. And this is Denmark, and I don't think the sun ever shines in this part of Denmark in the film. It's dark and dreary and gray and a lot of snow because the feeling is just cold in their home because they have been taught that in order to please God, you have to deny yourself any pleasure at all, nothing can be pleasurable. So they're eating their salted fish, and here comes Babette, a French lady who knows how to cook. They don't like what she fixes because it tastes too good. You don't want it, things to taste good. If things taste good, you might want to eat them more. And if you have fun, you might want to do some things in your life that aren't necessarily focused on God. Well, the story goes on. Babette would love to go back to France, and one thing she's done every year was to participate in the lottery. And then the day comes when she says to her family she would like to create a meal for them, a very special meal. They don't want this special meal because, you know, they're going to enjoy it too much, and you can't enjoy anything in life. But the 100th anniversary of their father's birth is coming up, and the founding of this church will be celebrated as well. So they finally agree, this little group of people, that they are going to allow her to cook this meal, but they promise themselves they will not enjoy it, and they will not tell her if they enjoy it. She cooks for days. Strange things arrive at the house, strange birds, and she's whacking their heads off, and little weird eggs, and all sorts of things, and she cooks and cooks and cooks. Finally, the day of the feast arrives, and one of the guests was the nephew or grandson of one of the people in town who comes, and he's a military leader, and one of the sisters recognizes him as the man that courted her and wanted to marry her until her father chased him off. He's traveled the world, and he says, I've never had food this fine except in a restaurant in Paris where the chef was this wonderful woman who cooked like no one ever has. And as the meal goes on and they start to enjoy it, and they can't hide their enjoyment of this meal, it's revealed that that chef indeed was Babette herself. And instead of spending her money on getting herself back home, she's won the lottery, and she spent the entire 10,000 francs on one meal for this group to show her appreciation for them taking her in. It means she'll never get home again. Now the film ends with these folks enjoying a meal, and they're out in the snow, and then you see them dancing, because they've learned to appreciate what God has done in their midst. And they say to Babette near the end, wait till the angels taste your cooking when you get to heaven. Now, maybe you wonder what that has to do with the wedding at Cana of Galilee, or what that has to do with World Communion Sunday. I picked this passage for World Communion Sunday and also for stewardship, because I think it starts at the beginning that we need to begin. God wants us to enjoy our lives. Now, 
Don't take that to the extreme, but God wants us to understand that we are blessed, that grace abundantly has been poured into us. Now, why in the world would Jesus pick this to be the first sign, the first miracle? There were people who needed healing. There were people who needed demons driven out. There were people who were living in poverty like we have never experienced. And we see Jesus touching these people and healing them. But in John, John who says, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. This is who God is for us in Jesus Christ. Abundance and blessing and grace. But sometimes we are so focused on pleasing God that we turn ourselves into these little machines that have to come to church and have to do this and have to do that. That is not what we're talking about with stewardship. Stewardship is recognizing and claiming what God has poured into you and then asking yourself, what do we do with it now? It's not always about money, although money's part of all that we've been given, but it's about blessings and grace and mercy and peace and healing and wholeness. How are we stewards of these things in our lives? What will we do with what God gives us? Now, Mary gives us the answer, do whatever he tells you. Don't you love that? Don't you love this very passage that shows Jesus as divine and human, which we claim about him in one, because his humanity is there. This is his mother, and he's fussing at his mother, and she just ignores him and says, do whatever he tells you. Can't you hear her say that? Do whatever he tells you. And he... I'm sure he did roll his eyes. It had to happen. You know it had to happen. And then what does he do? But he does what she says, and the water becomes wine. Now, it's not a trivial thing, because in that culture, in that time, hospitality is so critical in Jewish understanding of who God is and who we are to be in front of God with each other. Remember Abraham in the Old Testament, how he entertains those strangers who end up being angels who come to tell him that he's going to be a father even though he's as good as dead as the scripture said. He's that old. What does he do when they come? He kills the fatted calf. He brings out the best he has to offer for them. Hospitality is expected and blessed. There are some biblical scholars who suggest that perhaps in this culture too, a wedding would go on for days. You need to understand this. A wedding would go on absolutely for days and days and days. This was a time when water was not potable. People could not drink it and be safe. They had to drink fermented juice. That's why they drank wine, because it couldn't spoil. And to run out of wine was not just a faux pas. It was a dangerous thing. And the community also would participate in bringing the food. That's what I read some scholars suggest, that if it was not a rich family having a wedding, that the neighbors would, it would be their responsibility, their obligation as they came to the wedding to bring food, to bring wine that might be shared by everyone. For them to run out of wine was a terrible thing, and Mary understood that, and Jesus does too, and he brings out the best. You've heard the expression, saving the best for last, haven't you? Now, there was a woman in one of my congregations who was the best baker of sugar cookies I've ever made. No offense to any of you, but this woman had, she had me beat, and I baked good cookies. They were thin. You could see light through them if you held them up. They were perfect, each one. You know, when you're stamping cookies with a cookie cutter and you're doing intricate designs, sometimes part of the cookie stays in the cookie cutter or they break off or they burn a little bit. Hers were perfect. Every stinking cookie was perfect. And I said, I need your recipe. And she said, no, nah, I don't give it out. And I said, I really want your recipe. I, I want to sit with you when you bake cookies. I need to know the secret of this. And she said, there is no secret. And then finally she came one Sunday morning, she gave me a can. She said, take it home and open it. And I opened it, and it was all the broken, burned cookies. Because in order to get those perfect ones, there were a lot that got tossed. Those weren't the ones you put out first, are they? Those are the ones you put out when everybody's had enough cookies and you want them to go home. You start putting out the stuff that's broken or not as pretty or a little burn on the edges when you want people to start to go home. But Jesus takes this water and doesn't just turn it into wine. He turns it into really, really good wine. Not because he wants people to get drunk. Don't, don't go home and say, the pastor said, I can open some wine tonight. No, that was not what this is about. Although if you do that, do it in moderation and that's okay. But it's about the abundance that God wants to give us. The abundance that God wants to give us, to pour into us in every aspect of life. God wants us to enjoy our lives. Now, 
Lately, I've seen a lot of commercials on television about I need to put myself first. I'm not saying self-indulgence here. I love those Botox commercials where people are saying, I need to be first. You know what Botox is, don't you? It's botulism poison. You shoot it in your face. My husband had botulism toxin injections. He had Botox injections for his frozen features. Never got rid of his wrinkles. But the copay for Medicare on one of those shots was $1,600. So of course, if you want to sell this stuff, you've got to say, you've got to learn to put yourself first, don't you? Also, the exercise equipment commercials are saying, I need to put myself first. Exercise where? You've got to dress right if you're going to exercise. You need to learn to put yourself first. This isn't about putting yourself first any more than Jesus wants you to put yourself last. What does he say? Love one another as you love yourselves. But it's about recognizing what God wants to give you and what you're going to do with it. That's what stewardship is. What do we do with these blessings? Like I said, we missed a lot with COVID, and I'm tired of it too. I'm tired of wearing masks. I said hello to somebody yesterday at Bill's mother's funeral. I had my sunglasses on my mask. She said, I don't know, have any idea who you are. And I pulled my mask down, and she gave me a hug. We're all tired of this, and we could sit here and list all the ways that life has let us down and disappointed us. But what I want you to do is think about Jesus and think about Mary, his mother, who said, do what he tells you to do, because that's the key to stewardship, isn't it? Do what he tells you to do. I want you to go home this week. I want you to look at all the ways God has blessed you, even in the midst of all that we've lost. We have been blessed because we are together. We have been blessed because God is with us. We have been blessed because... God's grace abounds no matter what else we face. We have been blessed. It's a hard week for me. World Communion Sunday, 2016, I went home and found my husband on the floor. And the next Sunday, he died. But I'm blessed. I still give thanks for him every day of my life. It's one of my first prayers in the morning. I give thanks for you guys, too. You're a little lower on the list, but I always thank God for Richard every day. Because if you thank God every day, you will never forget that what you have been given is a gift. It's a gift. And then do what he tells you to do. What does he tell you to do but to love other people? And World Communion Sunday, I think, breaks God's heart in a way because we do not share communion widely in the body of Christ even. The church I served before coming here, Harmony United Methodist Church, sat smack between two Baptist congregations, one tiny, one very growing and progressive. They didn't have services together ever because the Baptists on the right didn't like the Baptists on the left because they had a woman minister of music. She never preached, never held authority, never taught men, but she was called a minister, and so the other group said, we can't worship with them. They were a tiny little church, and the grandson of one of my most faithful members attended there, and I said to him once, why don't you worship with them? And he said, we're the only people going to heaven. If Jesus came to save 102 Baptists and nobody else, I would be very surprised. And the Roman Catholic Church and the United Methodist Church have an official conversation going on on communion and reaching full communion. We're not there yet, and I doubt we ever will be in my lifetime. But on this World Communion Sunday, if we cannot stop and think about the world that God created, the world that God sends us into, that the blessings that we're given are not just for ourselves, but for everyone else that God loves and knows, we will never get beyond our own needs and wants and desires. So as we share communion, I want you to think about the Baptists who don't think we're going to heaven. I'm not saying that to denigrate them. I'm saying that because I hope they can see at some point the depth of God's grace. It's not about whether you dance or play cards. It's about how you use what God has given you in the world. That is what is going to bring us to Christ. That's what's going to point other people to Christ. Because trust me, telling somebody they're not going to heaven is a sure way to take them in the other direction. But if you invite them and you show them God's love because it overflows and pours out of your heart. You won't always be happy. You won't always get everything you want, but you will have blessings unimaginable. So this is your homework this week. 
I hope you will bring back your estimate of giving card, but it's not about that. What I want you to do this week is to go home and make yourself a list. I want you to sit down and write it out or type it on your computer. Where have I been blessed so greatly? Where has God worked in my life? And then ask yourself, what will I do about it? And if you need to know what to do about it, go back to the passage we read this morning and listen to his mother. Always listen to a good Jewish mother. Do whatever he tells you. Do whatever he tells you. Do whatever he tells you. Amen, amen, amen.